Okay, rules are rules, and we've got to follow them, especially when it comes to pen testing. Most of the time, these rules are designed to help cover your backside, as well as to set up limitations. And of course, yes, you know that there's going to be a plethora of choices. See, that's twice in one module that I've been able to use my favorite word. But when it comes to these choices, first of all, we need to look at the timing. Penetration tests can't be open-ended. The test should run between specific start and end dates, as well as times. Now, within that, there's also got to be the answer to the question of when test activities can be completed. Now, because some of the tests are extremely, how should we say, um, problematic at times, you may want to specify that tests on live systems are only done outside of company hours to help avoid problems. Now, the downside to this is that the network policies and intrusion detection systems are generally configured to view out of our access as suspicious. And also there's the aspect of you're not really giving them a real world environment because attackers aren't waiting until night. And there's also the issue of the scope. The pen test should actually be devised in a way that meets a specific goal. That goal is typically created by our risk assessment. So as an example, if the business has identified a risk with a severe impact but unknown likelihood, then the penetration test would be extremely useful in helping to qualify that risk. Now, pen tests themselves will generally be divided into three classes, determining external threats, identifying insider threats, and those that are aimed at application software development. Now, your scope should also specify the limitations. For example, if I'm doing a pen test on wireless, I am only gonna hit wireless. Or if by chance my scope is on file servers, I'm not gonna wander off into other uh, resources like trying to attack email servers or cloud services. Now the scope should also include, again, do I have physical access? Um, can I use social engineering components? Uh, on what sites, what departments, what staff is affected? All those choices within the scope helps to give, again, that real-world view of what could take place. Now, I mentioned earlier that there are different types of pen tests, and they can be summed up very easily. We have network services tests. We have client-side tests. We have web application tests, remote wireless security, social engineering tests, and remote tests, which would include things like cloud service connections. The other rule that we need to follow is to make sure that we specify the tools that we're going to be utilizing. And we always show that in documentation. I mean, imagine if I came to you and said, hey, I did a pen test, here are your vulnerabilities, but I'm not gonna tell you how I did it. And that's not what you're paying me for, right? And I need to make sure that you understand the tools that I've used because maybe you as a company, I'm speaking from a third party perspective here, but even internally, I wanna make sure I document what tools I'm using so that in the future, I can recreate and see if I've fixed my problems. Because in the future, I may want to try to see if I've fixed my problems by going through the same steps again. Okay, another one that you need to follow is, or rule is communication. You have to have a line of communication set up so that if something terribly wrong goes bad, the last thing you want to do is do a physical penetration test and somebody catches you and you get arrested. You need to have a contact as well as if you come across something that is mission critical that, that somebody needs to be aware of immediately. Who is that contact going to be? Another aspect is to determine in communication of do we do this with or without the staff's knowledge? If they know I'm coming, there's really no opportunity to assess their responsibility to what they will interpret as a genuine incident. Now, the downside, too, is if we do this without their knowledge, it has a tendency of creating you know, a worried environment after the fact, as well as possibly bad feelings, especially if the test involves social engineering. Now, it's also extremely important in your communication that you inform any outside parties, suppliers, ISPs, telecoms, any partners, any agencies such as the police, especially if it's a physical test. And there's also going to be some communication between teams, which we'll talk about a little bit later on. But the other rule that we have to make sure we follow is reporting. The principal outcome of a pen test activity should be reported describing the test activities how you did it, what were the results, what are your conclusions, what are the recommendations. We just don't complain, 
we offer solutions. Typically, reporting should also be preceded by a meeting where we get everybody together to discuss the outcomes of the pen test. Make sure no one has questions. Another rule that you have to follow, and man, I can't really get this across enough, make sure you have authorization. Just because you're an IT guy and you work for that company and you want to do your own little pen test does not mean you have the legal right to do so. Uh, many cases where people, employees, have been held accountable for doing things that they shouldn't be doing on the network. So when testing in a production environment, there are also issues regarding employees' privacy and data confidentiality, especially if the test involves third-party consultants. Now, if these issues are unresolvable, then you need to include in your scope the point in which the test ends, which would typically be before the actual personal or corporate data is compromised. This test typically has to be done in a simulated environment, and again, it is not as true to life. Now, there's also the issue about legal considerations based off the company's presence in different geographic locations. Most countries do have cybersecurity laws, and with those are criminal penalties for computer misuse, and penetration testing could be quite gray. Also, you should make sure that the authorization is in writing. Non-disclosures need to be included, as well as confidentiality agreements. Now, besides the scope and the timing of tests, you should also establish parameters for the testing techniques that you're going to be using, and that includes with the tools, or how in-depth you're going to go. Some of the things you may want to look at is like a no-holds-bar testing, where the consultant or the attacker is going to try to use any means possible to penetrate as deep as he can go within your network. We can also say that you know we only allow for perimeter testing. So in this case here, the consultant would have to stop and not attempt to exploit the breach or view confidential information or data if he's able to get past the perimeter. And one other thing you may want to consider is the attack profile. This is how the attacker looks at the, or in this case here, the third-party consultant, is going to look at the attack. Is he going to be doing it based off of a black box or a blind where we have no information about the network or the security system that's in place? Or a white box attack uh, where the consultant is given complete information about the network. And of course, there's also a gray one, which we are given the consultant or the attacker is given enough information. Typically, it would give them knowledge like a uh, non-IT staff person might have of your network infrastructure. And then the final rules, you've got to go off and buy yourself a really cool looking hat. So you look like a hacker or a hoodie because we all know that hackers wear those, right?